Hi, my name's Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about why apartments missed out on the recent property boom. So of course, it's been well documented what property prices did throughout uh, 2020 and 2021. And in most uh, capital cities, house prices... Uh, rose somewhere between 30 and 40 percent over that two-year period, uh, which seems like a lot, but the previous three years to that uh, weren't so great. In fact, it, it experienced negative returns. So therefore, really over the last five years, uh, it's still been, growth has still been below median. So we all get very excited about the last two years' worth of growth, and it has been, you know, it was very strong, of course, but we've got to put it in context. We can't get too excited about two years when the previous three weren't so great. We're just sort of making up for lost ground. But apartments uh, barely changed in terms of value. They dropped a little bit uh, and then they've come back a, a little bit since. So really we're looking at sort of two to three percent gains, particularly in Melbourne. And I wanted to discuss why is that the case. Uh, so what I have done, and you'll see a, a link in the show notes and of course on the blog on the website, I've charted uh, re- the relative value of houses compared to apartments. So using median prices, of course, uh, in the three main capital cities, Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, although the theme is relatively similar around the country. And normally uh, houses, the median value of a house is between 1.2 and 1.4 times higher than the median value of an apartment, which makes sense. Of course, houses are going to be more expensive. There's, There's a greater amount of land value and so forth. But over the last couple of years, the relative value of houses has increased significantly. So in Sydney and Brisbane, the median house price is now 1.6 times the median apartment price. And in Melbourne, the median house price is almost double the median apartment price. So again, the long-term average is closer to 1.2 to 1.4. So we can see either houses are overvalued or apartments are undervalued or maybe it's a little bit of each. So then let's think about what has contributed to this relative underperformance in the apartment market. Well, firstly, we know that uh, COVID and the lockdowns uh, negatively impacted to a much greater extent lower income earners. You know, these are sort of, they do the sort of occupations that don't really lend themselves to working from home. So if they're working in uh, retail, tourism, hospitality, those sorts of industries, once we're locked down, of course, you know, they were out of work and they had to rely on government benefits during that period. Uh, And a lot of lower income earners are are renters of apartments. So that had an impact on uh, vacancy, although, of course, you couldn't evict tenants. Uh, tenants could still move out during uh, lockdown periods uh, and obviously had an impact on rent. So we are giving uh, landlords who had to give, uh, you know, reductions in rent, rent-free periods, uh, those sorts of things, which is obviously going to impact the, the value and appetite for those sorts of assets. Whereas conversely, and just as a general a generalisation, I should say, is that homeowners are, tend to be occupied by higher income earners than apartment owners. So if you're a, an investor in an apartment, you know, you've, you've had to uh, forego some rent uh, and make some compromises there. If you're the owner of an apartment, um, again, it's likely that you're a low income earner and being impacted by COVID. So there's not a lot of buyers then out there for apartments. Whereas homeowners are a completely different um, kettle of fish. They're mostly, you know, the are higher income earners, um, and so they've uh, retained their income during the lockdown periods because they're typically practicing occupations that, that lend itself to working from home. They experienced a, a greater capacity to save money during that period, so stronger surplus cash flow. And then the third element is uh, falling interest rates. You know, when interest rates really came down throughout 2020 and 2021, you know, it really just improved uh, higher income earners buying power in the market. So really, if we look at COVID, it really hurt and created a lot of negative consequences for apartments in the main. Uh, And all the things that happened with COVID really created some uh, a really positive environment for home buyers. Uh, And so naturally, we're going to have that diversion in terms of performance. Now, of course, there's always going to be a gap between um, what a house costs and what an apartment costs. 
uh, of course, you know, houses have a, a larger land, direct land holding typically, uh, and also uh, just the mere supply and demand. You really can't change the supply of houses in a, particularly in a blue chip suburb. You know that blue chip suburbs, because of land value, the cost of land is so high, typically don't lend themselves to small subdivisions and so forth. So really, that the the number of houses in that in a particular location is fixed and finite. Whereas it's different for apartments where you can change the supply. You know, you might be able to buy a, a large block and build 20 apartments on it, for example. Uh, and so even those uh, relatively a smaller scale developments can still have a, an impact on supply. However, the gap between uh, houses and apartments can't extend perpetually. So at some point, uh, apartments start to become so much better value than houses and for particularly affordability can be an element. So for people that don't want to make a compromise in terms of locality, they want to live in a particular place or suburb, because house prices have risen so much, fewer people will actually be able to afford a house. But they don't want to make a compromise, so then they're forced into the apartment market and instead of buying a a small house, they might buy a a larger two-bedroom apartment. So there will be a point Uh, in the market that people start thinking the apartments represent much, much better value than houses and demand for apartments will rise. Now, when property buyers are looking for apartments, they obviously have the choice to buy an existing apartment or a new one, Uh, either one that's just brand new, being newly constructed or, in fact, off the plan, you know, before it's being constructed. And quite often, buyers are attracted to the shiny and new, aspect of a, of a building. They, those newer buildings can have other amenities as well, such as a pool and gym and, and, and so forth, which can attract people. Now, over the last uh, 10 or so years, there's been a lot of cheaply constructed um, apartments, particularly in these high-rise uh, buildings. And they, a lot of them were being sold to non-resident investors. So Chinese buyers, people from Hong Kong, etc. They'll go to a seminar, they'll be sold these investment properties, you know, with t- stamp duty savings and so forth, um, and it sounded like a good prospect. You know, you get a 5% yield. Uh, you, of course, there's no capital growth, um, but of course, uh, you know, anyone that's selling an apartment like that didn't bother mentioning it. Uh, since uh, 2018, the um, government really cracked down on how much uh, developers could sell to uh, non-resident buyers which means that now if you're a developer, you've really got to build a product that's going to be attractive for the domestic market. And if you're an Australian, you're going to be thinking about, thinking very carefully about uh, the quality of the build, you know, particularly with all the recent attention about uh, cladding and these sorts of things. Uh, And there's been a few buildings in uh, Sydney that uh, have had to have major rectification, cracking, uh, these sorts of things. So, I think buyers are now a lot more educated about the you know the quality of the construction, the quality of finish, uh, and they'll have to developers will have to build a, a better quality of stock. Notwithstanding, you know the recent uh, increases in raw materials and building and labour and those sorts of things. I was reading an article in the Australian newspaper um, where it was quoted that Harry Triggerboff, who is uh, probably Australia's largest um, a builder of apartments, uh, particularly in Sydney, but he's expanding around Australia. Uh, he's on the rich list. He's a billionaire. Anyway, he said that the cost of new apartments has to rise by at least 20% just to deal with the rising cost to, to construct those apartments, let alone now that they're going to have to construct them at a higher level. So a lot of cheap um, uh, stock has really come into the market and then obviously COVID, we you know there haven't hasn't been a lot of construction since COVID, particularly if you compared to say five ten years ago. But it, once construction does return, the quality will have to be higher, and that's good for the industry and good for the property market because that really does then push up the price point of apartments. Uh, it it will have a flow on effect to established apartments as well, uh, which really haven't experienced a lot of price growth over the last uh, ten years. And the final element I wanted to talk about uh, that had an impact on uh, apartment performance over the last couple of years is overseas immigration. 
Uh, students account for approximately 40% of temporary uh, migration, so temporary visa holders. And of course, they were completely ab absent between 2020 and 2021. Uh, and that had an impact, obviously, on apartments because if you're a student, it's likely you're renting an apartment, um, either yourself or with another person. Uh, and now that they have reopened the borders, obviously those um, temporary visa holders are going to come back into Australia and they're going to be looking for accommodation which will uh, push up rental yields uh, and then that will attract, in turn, attract more investors into the market. And so, again, that's had an impact on the last couple of years in terms of investment returns and performance. Nobel Prize winning economist Harry Markowitz was fond of saying that the market only gives us two free lunches. The first one is diversification and the second one is long horizon mean reversion. Now, of course, he's talking mainly about the stock market, so we'll ignore diversification uh, because that doesn't really apply to the apartment sector. But certainly long, term, long horizon uh, mean reversion does, which, uh, and I've done a podcast on this before, but it re really says that a period of underperformance is typically followed by a period of outperformance, uh, and the reverse is true also. So we know that the property market moves in cycles. Uh, it tends to be a flat cycle is followed by a growth cycle, is followed by another flat cycle. Those uh, cycles tend to last seven to ten years. Now, the um, particularly in Melbourne, the flat cycles have been a little bit longer than that uh, in the apartment market. History leaves clues around what performance might be in the future. So if we have a look at Melbourne apartment, median price apartment, for example, values, between 1980 and 2010, so that 30-year period, uh, the median uh, price grew by 9.2% per annum compounding. Uh, since 2010... Uh, the uh, median value has grown at 3.2% compounding, so well below the long-term average. Uh, and of course, long horizon mean reversion tells us after 12 years of relative underperformance, it's likely we'll have 12 years of relative overperformance. Now, of course, the period from 1980 to 2010 uh, benefited from two growth cycles and only one flat cycle. Uh, so I won't expect that your long-term return is going to be at 9.2%. In fact, the long-term return in that apartment market over that 42-year period is about 7.5%. So we've only got 3.2% over the last 12 years. So it means that we're probably likely to experience a double-digit return over the next 10 to 12 years uh, so that it reverts to that longer-term mean of 7.5%. A lot of numbers there. I hope I haven't confused you, but if I have, uh, certainly read, uh, read back at the notes or blog on the website. Now, I have the pleasure of hosting a webinar on the 27th of July uh, at lunchtime with uh, my colleagues at Wakeland Property Advisory, which is the buyer's agent uh, that I've used personally and that I refer clients to and have been referring clients to for almost 20 years. Uh, we are going to discuss the apartment market in detail and there's a, a lot of really good content that we've got to, to share with you, including some charts that I've been uh, working on. Our goal of the webinar is to really pull apart what has driven the past 12 years of underperformance and what do we expect um, in terms of uh, future performance from the investment grade apartment market here in Melbourne. Uh, and then also share some ideas, uh, particularly for existing investors, but also um, people that are thinking about making an investment, of what actions they can take to ensure that their apartment uh, will uh, benefit the most from the next growth cycle. So there's a link to register for that webinar. It, it is contained in the show notes and the blog on the website. All you have to do is uh, click the link and, and register. And I hope you can join us on the 27th. It's something I've been thinking quite deeply about. And I think we've put together a really good webinar on this uh, very topic, uh, not only aimed at people that have already invested in the apartment market uh, to get a sense of you know what they need to be doing to their investment to ensure it performs, uh, but also if you're looking for opportunities within the property market, uh, the apartment market could be a good one. Okay, that's it for me this week. Until next week, bye for now.